Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Every Monday I crash land this series straight to you to keep you in the loop about all things Starship development, launch news and events, and everything else. And we have another good one, lots of juicy Starship news, Falcon 9 successes, Rocket Lab takes over from Astra with launching the Tropics constellation, China launched a space station resupply mission, Curiosity finds a very interesting rock, NASA JPL is working on a rather slithery rover, and much, much more. Let's kick things off. SpaceX continued to press on with launch site repair work. Starship Gazer captured lots of video last week of the whole site swarmed with workers and machinery, removing tons of destroyed concrete and mangled rebar. In addition to the launch table and the concrete below, or I guess now the lack of concrete below, <laughs> the tower has had some of its shielding removed for repair or replacement. Expect post-launch repairs to be an ongoing theme for Starbase updates for the foreseeable future. It's going to take a long time to get the launch pad back to a usable state, though I am happy to see Elon take an optimistic approach with his hopes to get Booster 9 launched in under two months. I'll believe it when I see it, to be honest. As for the other vehicle that'll be used for the next orbital flight test, there's a fairly strong chance that it'll be Ship 28. This vehicle continues to undergo fabrication in the high bay. Here you can see its almost completely tiled exterior peeking out of the high bay opening. And just to the left of it, on Thursday, we saw Ship 29's nose cone lifted and stacked onto its common dome using the new two-point load spreader, though it was de-stacked again a short while later. Next door, in the Mega Bay, Booster 11's liquid methane tank began stacking as well. So despite the fact that the launch facilities are some way from being usable again, this doesn't appear to be deterring SpaceX's rapid build cadence for the Starships and Super Heavies. But wait, what is this? That thing, just there. It's my plushie! Okay, don't worry, this will be quick. I'm just popping this in to say that this will only be on sale for the remainder of this week, and then it'll be gone forever! If you want an in-thrust we trust plush, then click the card on screen or the link in the description and pick one up. And of course, when they start shipping later this year, I'll be running a competition to see who can land their astronaut in the coolest location. Winner gets a free copy of Kerbal Space Program 2, so it's all to play for. Act now, it's the last time you'll ever be able to get one, and I love mine. Uh, I was obviously sent one to film this advert and also just to see the, the sample. And I love it, I immediately bought three more, and uh, yeah, it's great. So that's just a, obviously... I'm biased, but I'm just I'm just saying I'm, I, I really like it. Okay, let's carry on. Make sure you like this video as well and subscribe. Got to get that out of the way. Let's get back to Starship news now. <laughs> if you want a piece of a Starship, then it looks like the Gulf of Mexico's tides have finally started bringing in pieces of what's left of Ship 24. Check out this heat shield tile haul by Bubba Gucci. If I were in Brownsville, I would definitely be heading down to the beach to grab myself a souvenir. Now I've saved the biggest piece of Starship news until last, and that was this tweet from Elon Musk, sharing the news that the still in development Raptor 3 just achieved 350 bar chamber pressure, or 269 tons of thrust. Now for comparison, Raptor 1 produced 185 tons, Raptor 2 230 tons, and now here we are with Raptor 3 with 269. Nice. Now, we don't know if this is how much the engine will put out during normal operation. Elon did later say that they didn't expect the engine to survive a full duration run at that pressure. This is uncharted territory. So they may want to dial it back when the engine enters service. We'll just have to watch this space. In addition to their ever busy Starship program, SpaceX executed another couple of Falcon 9 missions last week. The first was on the 10th of May, and this was Starlink Group 2-9. We were treated to a glorious blue sky daylight launch from the Vandenberg Space Force Base as the Falcon 9 blasted off the pad, carrying 56 Starlink satellites on board. Following second stage separation, the Falcon 9 first stage landed on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship, stationed in the Pacific Ocean. This first stage booster was B-1075, which has previously supported the SDA Tranche Zero launch and one Starlink mission. The other Falcon 9 launch we saw took place on Sunday, and this was another Starlink mission, this time Starlink Group 5-9, which again saw a Falcon 9 launch 56 satellites, though this time launching from the east coast, Cape Canaveral. Following stage separation, the first stage of Falcon 9 performed a successful landing on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. 
This first stage was B-1067, which has previously supported 10 missions, CRS-22 and 25, Crew-3 and 4, Turksat-5B, Utilsat Hotbird 13G, O3B Empower A, and three Starlink missions. The sunny shores of the Mahia Peninsula were host to another Electron launch last week. On the 8th of May, Rocket Lab conducted their Rocket Like a Hurricane mission, the mission name there being a tribute to the Electron's payload, two of the four remaining satellites for NASA's Tropics constellation. The satellites will work together to measure temperature, moisture profiles, and precipitation in tropical systems with unparalleled temporal frequency, providing data that will allow scientists to study the dynamic processes that occur in the inner core of storms. The first Tropics constellation launch was handled by Astra, which of course failed to reach orbit. The original announced plan was that NASA would just wait for Astra's Rocket 4 to be operational and then continue launching the Tropics satellites with Astra, but it looks like Rocket Lab have been asked to step in as they have been awarded the launch contract for all remaining Tropic satellites, the first being last week, and the next and final one being this week on Tuesday. NASA recently conducted another hot fire test of an RS-25 engine on the 10th of May, marking a significant step towards developing engines for future deep space missions. The test took place at the Fred Hayes test stand in NASA's Stennis Space Center, lasting over 10 minutes, or 630 seconds to be precise. This duration surpassed the required 500 seconds for launching the Space Launch System rocket on Artemis missions, providing an additional safety margin. The engine was fired at 111% and 113% power levels, matching the thrust needed during launch and ensuring operational safety. This hot fire test was the seventh in a series of 12 tests aimed at certifying the production of new RS-25 engines for upcoming Artemis missions, starting with Artemis V, with Aerojet Rocketdyne serving as the lead contractor. During an SLS launch, four RS-25 engines will work together to generate up to 2 million pounds of thrust. Meanwhile, at NASA's Jet Propulsion Facility, a team is making significant progress in developing and testing a versatile snake-like robot called EELS, which is an acronym that stands for Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor. Inspired by the ambition to explore previously inaccessible destinations on Earth, the Moon, and other celestial bodies within our solar system, EELS is intended to descend vents on Saturn's icy moon Enceladus and investigate its subsurface ocean. The robot has undergone extensive testing in various challenging environments, including sandy, snowy, and icy terrains, such as JPL's Mars Yard, a snowy ski resort in Southern California, and even an indoor ice rink. EELS has been designed to autonomously map, traverse, and collect data using scientific instruments yet to be determined, and it needs to be autonomous considering the long communication delay between Earth and deep space. Its autonomous capabilities enable it to perceive the environment, assess risks, navigate, and recover from issues without requiring human intervention. The EELS project commenced the construction of its initial prototype in 2019 and has continuously incorporated revisions based on testing outcomes. The team has experimented with different types of screws, utilizing white, 3D printed plastic screws for loose terrains like sand and soft snow, while employing sharper black metal screws for icy conditions. The current iteration of EELS, known as EELS 1.0, weighs approximately 220 pounds or 100 kilos and stretches 13 feet or 4 meters in length. It is worth noting that EELS is not currently associated with any specific NASA mission, but it's very exciting to see it develop nonetheless, and I can't wait to see this thing put to use in the future. Here's an interesting close-up photograph just released by NASA that was originally taken back in April by the Curiosity Mars rover. This is an interesting looking rock that measures 2.5 centimeters across, and what makes it interesting is how it resembles the open pages of a book. Such unique rock formations are frequently observed on Mars and are believed to have formed as a result of water seeping through cracks in ancient rocks, carrying along harder materials. Over time, wind erosion erodes the softer rock, leaving behind the more durable materials. The capturing of this image marked the 3,800th Martian day for the Curiosity rover mission. It's great to see this thing continue to soldier on. Over in China, on the 10th of May last week, we saw a Long March 7Y7 launch the Tianzhou-6 cargo spacecraft from the Wenchang spacecraft launch site. The Tianzhou-6 is the fifth cargo mission to the China space station, and roughly eight hours after launching, it successfully autonomously docked to the rear docking port of the Tianhe core module. 
After some downtime, Laon Aerospace returned to flight last week, launching an Apollo-style Juno mission that faced some absolutely disastrous bugs and Kraken attacks. I'm frankly amazed that the mission even worked, to be honest. If you'd like to check this video out, then there should be a link to it and my channel on screen now, as well as a link to my Patreon page, or you can join my YouTube channel member program using the links below this video. And if you do that, then you'll not only be helping to support this content, but you'll also get to see your name in lights like the awesome folk scrolling on the left. But that is the end of my space news video this week. I hope you enjoyed the flight and I'll catch you in the next one.